Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is part three of our suggested answers in civil law for the bar examination of September 2023. We have already uploaded part one and part two, and this will now complete our uh, contribution for your update. And so we, we said that uh, we already covered the following uh, modules. We have already covered the uh, subject matter of persons and family relations. We are now about to proceed to property, wills and succession, obligations and contracts, and conflict of law. So part three will complete the entire thing. So let us now proceed with the questions on property. In property, there were uh, somehow four questions asked and uh, they come from the subject matter of ownership, easements of right of way, and there are two questions on co-ownership, possession, and recovery. So let's start with the bar question on ownership. The bar question in ownership, uh, problem number 11, deals with donations under the atmosphere of contributing age. The problem reads, Alejandro was a married airline executive who had a clandestine love affair with a pilot, Francisca. Six years later, Francisca ended the affair amicably because she wanted to get married herself and start a family. She soon met David, another pilot, and they got engaged. On the occasion of the impending nuptials of Francisca and David, Alejandro, feeling nostalgic and generous, donated a valuable painting, exclusively his own and not conjugal, to Francisca. Upon learning of the donation, the wife of Alejandro, who knew of the romantic past between the two, filed a complaint to have the donation nullified. Is the donation valid, void, or voidable? Explain your answer. Our suggested answer, the donation is valid because Alejandro donated his exclusive property to Francisca at that time that they had they no longer have a relationship of contributing age. Donations are void for those made between persons who were guilty of adultery or contributing age at the time of the donation. Guilt of the donor and donee may be proved by preponderance of evidence in the same action. This is uh, provided in Article 739, Chapter 2 of the New Civil Code of Persons who may give or receive donations. So that, that essentially uh, uh, covers the subject matter of ownership. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. And so that, that's, that's it. So we now go to another interesting question and it has something to do with easements of right of way under property. On the question of easements uh, of right of way concerning compulsory easement, problem number 10 runs like this. Marvick inherited a piece of land and decided to farm it. The land was bordered on all sides by properties belonging to other owners. The surrounding property closest to the public highway is owned by Renato. Willing to pay compensation, Marvick talked to Renato about granting him access to the highway, but Renato refused. Renato reasoned that there is another access point for Marvick through a dirt road that connects to the public highway without passing through his property. Marvick argued that this is not convenient as it is twice the distance, circuitous, and unlit. 
As they could not reach an agreement, Mardik filed a complaint for easement of right of way against Renata. Should a compulsory right of way be granted in favor of Mardik? Mardik, explain your answer. Our suggested is no. Renato Serbian estate need not grant the compulsory right of way to Maribic. The dirt road allows Maribic to connect to the highway. His convenience cannot be the basis of the easement. Adequacy test in the case of the Choso versus Marcos, a 2011 case, and also another one in the case of Reyes versus Espalces Ramos, a 2015 case. The Dichoso case said that uh, referred to the adequacy test. If there is already an existing outlet from the dominant estate to a public highway, even if inconvenient, then the need to open another is unjustified. That is precisely the argument of Renato. And so that therefore Renato is not bound to uh, give compulsory right of way to Mardi because there is already a better. The convenience of the dominant estate's owner is not the basis for granting an easement of right of way, especially if the owner's, uh, owner's needs may be satisfied without imposing the easement. The owner or any person who by virtue of a real right may cultivate or use any immovable, which is surrounded by other immovables pertaining to other persons, and without adequate outlet to a public highway, is entitled to demand a right of way to the neighboring estates after payment of the proper indemnity. And there is a pahabul here, it says, the need for easement of right of way is determined by six factors. Number one, the dominant estate is surrounded by other immovables. Number two, it is without an adequate outlet to a public highway. This is the case. Uh, three, proper indemnity has been paid or to be paid. Four, the isolation was not due to the proprietor of the dominant estate's own acts. Number five, the right of way claim is at a point least prejudicial to the Serbian estate. And number six, the right of way must be absolutely necessary for the normal enjoyment of the dominant estate. Okay? So, very interesting uh, problem that was given in the box. And now, the uh, third, fourth question under property. And let's read. This is something to do with co ownership, two problems. The first problem on co ownership. It's something to do with uh, the share in the benefits of the ownership. So let's take a look at problem number eight. Nicolo and his girlfriend Mayan were classmates in medical school. When they finished their studies and started earning, they decided to invest in a condominium unit together which they hoped to lease out. Since Nicolo came from a rich family and is still receiving an allowance from his parents, the couple decided that Nicolo would shell out two-thirds of 10 million of the 15 million purchase price, while Mayan would continue, uh, would contribute one-third of 5 million. They asked a mutual friend who was a law student to draw up a contract which reflected the mentioned interests. The contract also had a provision that their shares in the benefits as well as the charges affecting the property would be equal. They then found a long-term tenant who rented the property at 30,000 pesos per month. Unfortunately, Nicolo and Mayan broke up and are now quarreling over their respective shares in the rental income. Nicolo insists that he should get 20,000 or two-thirds of the monthly income while Mayan claims that it should be 15,000 each. Who is correct? Explain your answer. Our suggested answer, Nicolo is correct that their share in the co-ownership income 
shall be in proportion to their contributions. Nicolo gets two-third share for his 10 million capital contribution, while May Ann receives one-third for her 5 million capital contribution. The contract provision on equal sharing in the benefits is void for being contrary to the proportionate sharing that govern co-ownership. And under Article 485, it reads, the share of the co-owners in the benefits as well as in the charges shall be proportional to their respective interests. Any stipulation in a contract to the contrary shall be void. The portions belonging to the co-owners in a co-ownership shall be presumed equal unless the contrary is proved. Okay, so that's one problem in co-ownership. The second problem in co-ownership has something to do with the uh, co-ownership resulting from property that was inherited. And this is problem number nine. Lani and Rufino died leaving four children, two of whom are Arturo and Boy. The heirs signed a document selling half of the property to their parents, uh, uh, of their parents to their friend, Honorato. One of the remaining quarters was occupied by Ildefonso and Bienvenido, the children of Arturo, while the other quarter was sold by Bugoy to the spouse's cruise by virtue of a deed of sale. Shortly after, the spouse's cruise filed an ejectment case against Ildefonso and Bienvenido for the one-fourth portion of the subject property that they purchased. On the other hand, Ben Benito filed a complaint for recovery of ownership, quieting of title and annulment of deed of sale against the spouse's crews. He alleged that the deed of sale is void since Bugoy is not the true and real owner of the subject property which originally belonged to the estate of Rufino. On the other hand, the spouse's crews argued that Ben Benito availed of the wrong remedy and claimed that the heirs had already agreed to divide the property among themselves when they allowed a portion of the property to be occupied by the heirs of Arturo. With the complaint of Bienvenido Prosper. Uh, our answer is no, Bienvenido's complaint will not prosper. The four children as heirs are co-owners of the total undivided estate. Honorato and spouses Cruz cannot claim any specific part of the entire property because there has yet no partition for the boundaries of the four shares to be determined. They bought only the successional rights of the heirs. Take note that, successional rights. Not being an heir like his father, Buenvenido cannot exercise any right to take action concerning the undivided estate. The fact that the co-owners allowed Arturo to his sons to use the undivided estate did not amount to partition. And continuing now, it says, unless there is a partition of the estate of the deceased, either extrajudicially or by court order, a co-heir cannot validly claim title to a specific portion of the estate and send the same. Actually, siguro sell the same. Title to any specific part of the estate does not automatically pass to the heirs by the mere death of the decedent. And the effect of any disposition of a lower, uh, lower I'm sorry, disposition of a co heir before partition shall be limited to the portion which may be allowed to him and upon the dissolution of the communal estate. What a co heir can validly dispose of is only his hereditary rights. And so that is uh, so far uh, the problem on co ownership in the bar examination of 2023. Uh, essentially, the four problems in a property have already been covered. And so, I'm sorry to, to show this. This is not supposed to be the subject matter 
Well, let's take a look. Let's go back to our main schedule, which is the uh, which is now showing the third uh, category that we need to go to: wills and succession. So, in wills and succession, let's take a look at what the bar problem gave us. There are two questions on wills and succession. The first one has something to do with testamentary succession. And the second one is the intestate succession. In testamentary succession, the problem runs like this. It has something to do with the legitimate of the surviving spouse. Problem number 12. The problem reads, Cora, who was married to Wenceslao, executed a last will and testament where she gave all of her exclusive properties to her niece, Alma. Cora later died without issue. Wenceslav subsequently opposed the probate of her will on the ground that he was deprived of his legitimate. Is Wenceslav correct? Explain your answer. Yes, Wenceslav is correct. His wife's exclusive properties forming part of her estate as a legitimate, which is one half of said estate, which is reserved for the surviving spouse in the absence of children as direct descendants. Cora's remaining asset after her husband's legitimate is the free portion which she can give away to her niece Alma. If the only survivor is the widow or widower, she or he shall be entitled to one half of the hereditary estate of the deceased spouse and the testator may freely dispose of the other half. Wenceslao, as the surviving spouse, receives one half of white Cora's exclusive property as his legitimate. Miss Alma receives the remaining one half free portion as the main beneficiary in Alma's will. Decided in the case of Article 900, Section 5, Chapter 2 of the New Civil Code. And at the time, while the description is very encouraging, the point of the matter is uh, that uh, the husband cannot deprive of his own share of the legitimate. So that is what is the essence of this particular. The next uh, problem on wills and succession has something to do with intestate succession. No testament, no last will and testament. And let's find out what is the interesting issue here. It has something to do with the legitimate uh, to the illegitimate child on the grandparents or ascendants estate. Take a look at problem number 13. Very interesting. Felicia and Rocky met at a training convention and subsequently became lovers. They had children named Enrico and Yuris. One night, on his way home, Rocky met his end when his car collided with a speeding 15-wheeler truck along C5. A year later, the father of Rocky, Hilario, suffered a brain aneurysm and died. In the settlement of the estate of Hilario, Enrico and Yuris claimed an interest in the estate of their grandfather. They argued that as the biological tribune of Yako, uh, Rocky, they are entitled to inherit from their parents by right of representation. The, legitim, uh, the legitimate heirs of Hilario vehemently opposed the claim on the ground that Enrico and Duris are barred from hearing from the ascendants of in, uh, no, barred from inheriting not hearing from inheriting from the ascendants of Rocky are the legitimate heirs of Hilario correct. Explain your answer. Our suggested answer is no. The legitimate heirs of Hilario are not correct. Hilario's illegitimate children Enrico and Ruiz are entitled to inherit by right of representation. 
their share from their uh, grandfather uh, Hilarius free portion is one half of each Rocky's child coming from the free portion. Okay. The family code recognizes only legitimate and illegitimate children. Children can inherit from their ascendant by way of representation which the pre, the, which the, their parent uh, when their parent dies ahead. The legitimate of the legitimate children consists of one half of the ascendant's estate. Kasi that will be what would uh, go to their father and they are representing their father. The free portion answers for the legitimate of the illegitimate children computed at one half of the share of the legitimate child. So, if one half of the uh, parents' uh, properties or estate were to be given to the uh, what we call it, to the grandchildren, the grandchildren should include the illegitimate children. And the way they will partition it is the entire one half will go to the, the legitimate children and if they are four, they divide that uh, property by four. Let's say for the sake of argument, uh, you get 400 square meters there with some land. And so that therefore, it would be very beneficial for you since you have your settling here in the Philippines on your retirement and your other brothers and sisters are not. So you say it is convenient for me to take over that particular property. So the legitimate of the legitimate children consists of one half of the ascendant's estate the free portion answers for the legitimate of the illegitimate children, computed at one half of the share of a legitimate child. The legitimate of each legitimate child shall consist of one half of the legitimate of a legitimate child under Article 176 as uh, amended. In the legitimate of the illegitimate children, shall be four-fifths of the legitimate of an acknowledged natural child, which is one-half of the legitimate of each of the legitimate children or descendants. Let me cut this short by saying that in the case of Daniel Rivera versus Flora Villanueva, it was already explained you know, that uh, somewhere uh, the kind of partition would be one-half of the total estate would go to the uh, legitimate children. And then it will be pre-computed how much is one half of the share of each. And out of that, the law is saying that you will, uh, if you are really an illegitimate child, you get four-fifths of the one half. However, that particular uh, concept does not anymore work under the family code. Because the family code already eliminated the subgroupings of natural children. They were just called to be illegitimate children and would enjoy the consequences of that. Well, that, that covers our uh, two problems in Wilson succession. So it's time for us to go back to our main event. So here, we have already, uh, we have already covered persons and family relations of six questions. We have covered property of four questions. We have covered wills and succession of two persons. And then we left uh, hanging the, uh, the big, big uh, module on obligations. And contract. But we'll go into that. And then finally, conflict flows to end this particular uh, session. So on obligations and contracts, problem number seven. We are given a profile of exactly what problems are under obligations and contracts. In obligations, there are two problems that are given. In contracts, one problem. In the contract of sale, one problem. In the question of loan, guarantee, pledge, or mortgage, one problem. There is one uh, problem in the category of sexual, uh, extra sexual obligation. And finally, there's a problem on torch and damage been able to set aside one problem or that thing uh, in the future. So continuing now with obligations.
The uh, first topic under uh, subject uh, uh, under number 14 would be the need to demand on an obligation that was already dated. And so we run this and say the promissory note between Joseph and Mario states, Joseph agrees and understands that upon failure on his part to pay the amount of 100,000 pesos on December 31, 2015, he agrees to pay the sum equivalent of 6% interest uh, monthly from the date of the default until the entire obligation is fully paid. Jo Joseph failed to pay on the stipulated date. On March 1, 2016, Mario filed a collection suit against Joseph. In his defense, Joseph stated that he was not yet uh, in legal delay as Mario had not made a demand against him. This is the contention of Joseph. Well, you know, as a general rule, it has to be, of course, the courtesy of sending your uh, demand. Sometimes it gets to be more diplomatic. Our suggested answer, no, Joseph's contention is not correct. There was no need for Mario to demand payment for Joseph to incur legal delay. The promissory note already declared Joseph in default on 31 uh, December 2015 when he already paid, he already agreed to pay interest upon default precisely on December 31, 2015. The obligation itself indicated that demand is not necessary for the delay to be incurred. In Rodrigo versus Chua, the Supreme Court did the opportunity to say that the note states the date of payment to be 31 December 1995. Followed by demand by the creditor is no longer necessary in order that delay may exist since the contract itself already expressly so declares. The mere failure of spouses Chua to immediately demand or collect payment the value of the note does not exonerate, exonerate Rivera from his liability. And problem, uh, this is now uh, under problem number four. These are additional footnotes from the Supreme Court. It says, those obliged to deliver or to do something in current delay from the time the, ob the obligee judicially or extrajudicially demands from them the fulfillment of their obligation. However, the demand by the creditor shall not be necessary in order that delay may exist, such as number one, when the obligation of the law expressly so declares. Okay, so that, that covers now obligations and obligations and contracts. We now move on to a second uh, obligation, which is payment of obligation under the Shon and Pago. Problem number 15. On September 6, 2015, Mario purchased from Antonio a motorcycle, evidenced by a deed of sale. The purchase price was 88700 with a down payment of 35000 and the balance payable in 12 monthly installments due and payable on the first day of each month, starting December 1, 2015. As security for the balance, Mauro executed a chattel mortgage over said motorcycle in favor of Antonio. However, Mauro failed to pay the monthly installments. After Antonio extrajudicially demanded payment for the balance, Mauro returned the property to Antonio. Is the return of the motorcycle equivalent to the Sion and Pago? Explain. Our humble position is, yes, the return of the motorcycle is equivalent to the Sion and Pago. The Sion and Pago exists when there is A, existence of a money obligation, B, alienation of the creditor of debtor's property with the former's consent, 
and C. Satisfaction of the money obligation. Mauro's return of the motorcycle should fully pay his debt in the Sion and Pan. And so it says, continuing to, to uh, disclose some justification, the Sion in payment whereby property is alienated to the creditor in satisfaction of a debt in money shall be governed by the law of sales. And continuing now, it says, the Sion and Pago is in the nature of a sale because property is alienated in favor of the creditor in satisfaction of his debt on instrument. For a valid decision and pa Pago to transpire, however, the attendance of the following elements must be established, namely A, the existence of a money obligation, B, the alienation to the creditor of the property by the debtor with the consent of the former, and C, the uh, satisfaction of the money obligation of the debtor. To have a valid decision uh, in power. To have a valid decision in power, therefore, the alienation of property must be must fully extinguish the debt. Okay? So that essentially finishes our question on obligations. We now go into contracts. The subject matter of contracts address the the terminology of stimulation stipulation for for outreach on a contract at least. Let us take a look at the problem number 16, very short. But, uh, and if the ex examinee knows what is stipulation for outlay, okay na. So the problem reads, Nardo leased a house and lot from Jericho. Subsequently, Nardo subleased his property, this property to Paquito. The contract of sublease contained a stipulation to the effect that the rental payment must be uh, the rental payment to Paquito should be paid directly to Jericho, the principal. Now, is this a stipulation for outreach? Okay. Our answer is no. This is not a stipulation for outreach. The contracting parties, Nardo and Paquito, did not encounter a favor upon Jericho, the third person but this situation is merely incidental benefit to this sublease agreement. Okay. Uh, further, Jericho, as the third person, did not communicate his acceptance to Nardo. Neither Nardo or Paquito is third person, Jericho's legal representative with uh, authority from uh, either Nardo so let us now close our deal here so we can now proceed to the subject matter of sale. This one in sale, uh, I feel very comfortable because here, uh, my dear friend, uh, she's, she's her name is San Jose. Anyway, uh, this is a subject matter of double sale of land. And the rule would be, if there are two or more buyers, who would have the priority to, uh, to become owner? So problem number 17 reads, On October 10, 2010, Joaquin executed a deed of absolute sale in favor of Juancho involving the parcel of land of Joaquin situated in Surigao del Sur. Wancho did not uh, Wancho did not register the deed of absolute sale with the register of deeds of Sirigao and Monte. On October 30, 2010, Joaquin also executed another deed of absolute sale over the property in favor of Martina 
who had no knowledge of the prior sale between Joaquin and Juancho. Neither Juancho nor Martina took possession of the parcel of land subject of the two sales. However, after learning of the October 10, 2010 sale, Marina immediately caused the registration of her uh, October 30, 2010 deed of option sale. The only reason that uh, Martina did not fully question the situation was uh, because uh, she can register in the money. So Martina immediately caused the registration of her October 30, 2010 deed of absolute sale with the register of deeds of Surigao del Sur. Sabi niya, ah, naisahan kita. Will Martina be able to invoke the principle first in time, stronger in right as against one to discuss? Our suggested answer is no. Martina cannot invoke the principle first in time, stronger in right as against one to. She was not in a good she was not in good faith when she received her purchase in the registry in the registry of property. She already knows about the first sale to Wancho when she recorded her purchase. The law provides that the double sale of removables transfer ownership to number one, the first registrant in good faith. Second, then the first possessor in good faith. And third, finally the buyer who in good faith presents the oldest. Reading now, the law provides that a double sale of immovable transfers ownership. Ah, natapos na natin to. Yung second collatilia would be, if the same thing should have been sold to different vendees, the ownership shall be transferred to the person who may have first taken possession thereof in good faith if it should be movable property. So that doesn't apply. Article 1544 will apply under this concept of should it be immovable property, the ownership shall belong to the person acquiring it in good faith. Uh, first recorded it in the registry of property. And second, should there be no question on good faith. The ownership shall pertain to the person who in good faith was first in the possession and in his absence uh, in, the, in uh, uh, releasing the, uh, uh, the, 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 the the person would now be showing that she registered the property in the Okay, so that would complete the uh, subject matter on sale, a double sale. That still allows us to look at the question, one question on loan guarantee pledge or mortgage. And under this particular uh, problem, under problem number 18, pledge or mortgage, we are introduced to the concept of Pactum Commissorium. Pactum Commissorium, uh, Ibrahim borrowed money from Fidel as evidenced by a loan agreement. Ibrahim used as collateral for the loan his parcel of land situated in Maria Luisa Estate Park in Cebu City. Under the terms of their agreement, Fidel has the exclusive and irrevocable option to buy the collateral for the amount of 100,000, uh, 100 million pesos, inclusive of the borrowed capital of 50 million and interest thereon at 6%. Uh, when the loan matured, Ibrahim was made to pay his loan collection. Ibrahim, however, refused to sell his collateral to Fidel. May Fidel compel Ibrahim to sell the collateral by exercising the option to buy under the loan agreement. Discuss your answer. Our suggested answer is no. Fidel may not compel Ibrahim to sell his collateral under the option to buy in the loan agreement. Said irrevocable option is null and void 
being tactum commissorio. Under Article 2088, it says, The creditor cannot appropriate the things given by way of pledge or mortgage or dispose of them. Any stipulation to the contrary is null and void. And he continues to read now. In the case of spouses Roberto and Adelaida Penn uh, versus uh, Anna and Lisa Fugian. So on this part portion, we read now, the elements of tactum commissorium are that there should be a pledge or mortgage wherein properties pledge or mortgage by way of security for the payment of the principal obligation. B, that there should be a stipulation for an automatic appropriation by the creditor of the uh, thing pledge or mortgage in the event of non-payment of the principal obligation within the same uh, stipulated period. Now, there is an additional uh, note here from the students. It says, the authorization for Adelaida to appropriate the property subject of the mortgage may authorization na kunan na niya yung property na naka-mortgage hindi makabayad. It says, the haste with which the transfer of property was paid upon the default or the, the, the haste with which the transfer of property was made upon the default by Linda on her obligation and the eventual transfer of the property in a manner not in the form of a valid discussion and pago ultimately confirms the nature of the, of the transaction as a pactum commissorium. Okay. So that is how the whole thing works now. On the extra contractual obligation, here it has something to do with the owner, uh, the, the liability of the owner for a motor vehicle fission where it is his driver that was involved. So problem number 19 reads, Luna owns a passenger bus driven by her employee, Tomas. One day, the passenger bus collided with a car driven by Graciano. Graciano then filed a complaint for damages based on Quasar Delic as a lawyer person. He likewise instituted a criminal action against Tomas, but failed to res reserve his right to institute a separate civil action for damages in the said criminal case. Luna filed a motion with the trial court for the deferment of trial, arguing that Tomas must have been, must have been impleded in the civil case because he committed the, the negligent act that caused damage to Russia. Is uh, Luna correct? Our suggested answer is no, Luna is not correct. As Thomas' employer, Luna is solely liable for the damages his employer driver Thomas caused. The civil action versus Luna can be can can proceed. And the clinching argument is. Employer shall be liable for the damages caused by their employees acting within the scope of their assigned task. And it reads now, in motor vehicle mishaps, the owner is solidarily liable with this driver. If the former who was in the vehicle could have by the use of the due diligence prevented the misfortune. But Luna, the owner was not in the motorcycle, so he, he was not absorbed uh, the obligation arising from the uh, carelessness or recklessness of his driver. So he becomes uh, solely liable as an employer for the damage which Thomas, the employee, committed. 
Luna, as the registered owner of the bus, is the employer of the third diesel driver, Tomas. She is primarily and solely liable for the uh, court act, tort committed by driver Tomas under the principle of, uh, of uh, what? Of, uh, somewhere. Under the principle of pater familias. Luna is liable for failure to exercise due care and vigilance over the goods of one subordinates to prevent damage or uh, injury to another. So here is Article 2176, 2180, and 2140. And these are relatively new uh, class. So finally, if we're done with extra contractual obligations we now go to torts and damages in torts and damages the problem zeroed in on funeral expenses of the victim so problem 20 the last problem reads like this rene and sebastian who are bitter enemies engage in a gunfight in the ensuing battle rene killed sebastian with a shot to the head. The criminal case uh, for murder filed against Rene. The heirs of Sebastian failed to establish funeral expenses to widow damages. No? Uh, Sebastian failed to establish uh, funeral expenses due to inadequacy of evidence. Still, the court awarded temporary damages to the heirs declaring that it cannot close its eyes to the fact that the heirs of Sebastian indeed incurred funeral expenses. Is the award proper? Discuss. Our suggested answer is yes. The award of temporary damages is proper for deceased Sebastian's funeral expenses, which cannot be established for inadequacy of the And it reads now, Temporary damages may be awarded to the heirs of Sebastian, which are more than uh, uh, person who committed to a drug to, to uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I would erase this one because it doesn't get to be relevant to the subject matter. Just, uh, and so that completes obligations and contracts under CD law. And therefore, the remaining uh, subject matter is that single problem on conflict clause. And that happens to be problem number one and looks very interesting. Here, the subject matter is child support in a foreign divorce where the nationality theory is matched with a penal law in the Philippines. Problem 1 reads, Christopher, a citizen of the United States, married Lila, or Lila, a Filipino in Dallas, Texas. Their marriage was later terminated by a divorce decree issued by a U.S. court. At the time, their child Amado was only 18 months old. Lila and Christopher returned to the Philippines and settled in El Nido. Christopher allegedly promised to give support to Amado in the amount of 1,000 US dollars per month, but he never did. Subsequently, Christopher also settled in Cebu, where he cohabited with another Filipino woman. When Lila learned of the whereabouts of Christopher, she filed a complaint against him for violation of the anti-violence uh, against women and children. And for this violation, she asked their, their, uh, their uh, cousin to handle the, 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 the particular case. The proposed answer is yes. Lead, lead, uh, Lila is correct that Christopher, as Amado's legitimate father, needs to support his legitimate child. The law on anti-violence against women and children, a prohibitive law, 
concerning persons, their acts of property, and those which have for their object public order, public policy, and good customs shall not be rendered ineffective by laws or judgments promulgated or by determinations or conventions agreed upon in a foreign country. When the foreign law, judgment, or contract is contrary to a sound and established public policy of the forum, the said foreign law judgment or order shall not be applied. Continuing now. U.S. citizen Christopher cannot be protected under the nationality theory because his failure to support his child becomes a criminal act which has foreign law, which his foreign law cannot defeat before Philippine courts. This is a decided case of Norma L. del Socorro uh, versus Ernest Johan Brickman van uh, Wilson, a 2014 decision. So that should essentially err, uh, uh, that should essentially end our discussion on civil law. So that would now comprise the entire uh, 20 problems in civil law uh, as already highlighted. So uh, we would like to, to, uh, to, to end our discussion on this one. So here we now say end of show and we now